So, we've all heard about the Biafran War. The Biafra War. The Republic of Biafra. Biafra Movement. The Biafra Agitators. The Biafran War. Had over a million people dead by its end. The realities of this civil war are nowhere more apparent than in the frontline town of Abba, which is now in the hands of federal troops. The estimates for the number of casualties during the war vary from a couple hundred thousand to which tens of millions. The trolley is being reclaimed by the jungle out of which it was built. To fully grasp the war, we'd have to go back all the way to the start, back to where it all began, October 1st, 1960. Lagos Racecourse is the scene, and it's the afternoon of Nigeria's great day, with thousands awaiting the climax and resolved to relish every minute leading up to it. Princess Alexandra would suggest... Actually, we would have to go back even further, back to where it actually started in 1914. You see, in 1914, under the administration of Lord Frederick Lugard, the amalgamation of the Northern and Southern Protectorates culminated in the formation of Nigeria as a unified entity. While this historical milestone serves as a foundational point, it is imperative to acknowledge the intricate and extensive depth of Nigeria's history beyond this pivotal event. Well, as we all know, Nigeria is divided into three major ethnic groups. The Yorubas in the southwest, the Igbos in the southeast, and the Hausas in the north. Well, back then, it was the same exact thing. There were the Yorubas, there were the Igbos, and there were the Hausas, being the three major ethnical groups. But, the difference being, back then, the lines and the diverseness between these groups was much, much more vivid. The diversity between the Igbos and the Yorubas was much less noticeable than the diversity between the both of them and the Northerners. And this wasn't a case of just celebrating diversity, no. There were a lot of serious socio-political issues that they just didn't see eye to eye and there was nothing anyone could do about it. One obvious one being, of course, religion. The Northerners, or the Hausas, were predominantly Muslims and the Igbos and Yorubas were predominantly Christians, more so the Igbos. They had adopted Christianity quite fast. It is also important to note that in the 1960s, where our story takes place, Nigeria was not divided into states, but regions and there were four of them, the northern region, the western region, the eastern region, and the midwestern region. It is also important to note that the eastern region, where the Igbos lived, became a key part of Nigeria when in 1956 oil was discovered. You see, in the 60s, the early days of Nigeria, there was a lot of political unrest and the people were dissatisfied with the low living qualities, which was in high contrast to the lavish lifestyles of the politicians. Nigeria was off to a very bad start. This unrest led to a labor strike in 1964, where the government was forced to listen to the cries of the people and their wishes were granted. But there was one more thing that agitated the people, especially the people of the South. And this was the inequality in power share. Despite the fact that Northerners were much less educated than their southern counterparts, they still had the major share in powers. They held most political roles and in the army it was the same situation. Most of the soldiers in the army were from the north. And the northern leaders did nothing to reassure the southerners. This would prove fatal. One thing I've noticed, Premier, while I've been here, is that Northerners seem to have, I might almost call it, obsession about the Igbos. Could you perhaps explain that to me? Well, the Igbos are more or less the type of people whose desire is mainly to dominate everybody. If they go to a village, to a town, they want to monopolize everything in that area. If you put them in a labor camp as a laborer, 
Within a year, they will try to emerge as headmen of that camp, and so on. Well, in, in the past, our people were not alive to their responsibilities, because you can see from our northernization policy that in 1952, when I came here, there weren't 10 northerners in our civil service here. Then I tried to have it northernized, and now all, all important posts are being held by northerners. Is this policy of filling all key posts in the north solely with northerners and not with other Nigerians? When you have a country filled with people of different ethnic backgrounds and ideologies who have neither the will nor the power to make things work, you can only get one thing. That's disaster. Most of the politicians and high-ranking officers were comfortable with the state that Nigeria was in. It didn't affect them or their families, but not all of them. This is where Patrick Chukuma and Ziogu Kaduna comes in. He was a lieutenant colonel in the Nigerian army and was greatly disturbed by the treatment of the people of Nigeria, especially his people, the Igbos. This is what led him to incite the first bloody coup of Nigeria on the 15th of January, 1966. Abubakar Tafawa Balewa, the Prime Minister, was killed. Suramadu Bello, the Premier of the Northern Region, was killed. Samalakin Tola, the Premier of the Western Region, was also killed. Patrick Chukuma's original intent was to eliminate the high-ranking leaders of the country and instate himself as the head of state. The final phase aimed at seizing control of Lagos which at the time served as the capital of Nigeria. However, Agui Ronsi effectively intervened, squashing the coup and apprehending all those involved. And this is where the story gets interesting. Agui Ronsi himself, a military figure of Igbo descent, played a significant role in these events, adding an intriguing dimension to the narrative. The story goes like this. Allegedly, the Igbo military officers devised a strategic plan aimed at wrestling power from the Hausa and the Yorubas and that the coup led by Chukuma Kaduna was just a decoy in the master plan to instate Agu Ironsi as the head of state. This conspiracy spread like wildfire amongst the northerners and in all fairness to them, the conspiracy held some water because after Agu Ironsi took over, he didn't execute the masterminds behind the coup, rather, he sent them to prison, which was quite odd. Another thing that was suspicious was the president at the time, Nam Azikiwe, was not present during the time of the coup, he was on holiday, which therefore saved him from execution. And guess of what ethnic group he belonged to? That's right, he was of the Igbo ethnic group. So, in some ways, this conspiracy did hold some water, but we will probably never know the truth. This catalyzed a precursor to the ensuing conflict, exacerbating the animosity between the Hausas and the Igbos. The aftermath saw approximately one million Igbo residents in the north forced to flee back to their homelands in the southeast, abandoning their businesses and possessions. Tragically, an estimated 30,000 Igbos were killed, furthermore deepening the scars in this unforgettable chapter in Nigeria's history. An account from a journalist who had been in Nigeria at the time said it was so bad that the officers had to apologize for the stench coming from the decaying corpses of the murdered Igbo people, reassuring him that they were doing the world a favor by getting rid of the Igbos. At this point, Agu Yuronsi was out of the picture. He had been overthrown in a coup led by Yakubu Danjuma Gowon, who was now the new military head of state. It was decided by the Gowon government that enough was enough and something needed to be done about the ethnic tensions and so 
the Gowan led government, and other key figures in Nigeria, one of which was Chukwe Mekao Dumegu Ojuku, who was the premier of the eastern region, met in a little Ghanaian town and agreed on terms that were aimed to ease the tension, and they called it the Aburi Accord. While the exact details of the accord are not fully known, but Ojuku left the meeting quite pleased with the satisfaction that his people would finally be heard and feel safe. Everything seemed to be on the up for Nigeria, until the situation took a turn for the worse when Gowon, upon returning to the country, disregarded the terms outlined in the Apuri Accord. Instead, he divided the country into 12 regions in a manner that disadvantaged the Igbo people, particularly by obstructing their access to the oil-rich regions in the south. This action greatly infuriated Ojuku. Chuku Emeka Ojuku declared the secession of the eastern region from Nigeria, establishing the independent state of Biafra on May the 30th, 1967. If civil war comes, and I do think it is imminent, you're quite right, it will for us be the price of freedom.